Hello and welcome. In our lesson today, we are going to tackle practical questions on support and movement. Now before we start, I would like to say this. This is part 1. I'll be uploading part 2 soon, so be sure to check it out. Now, I want to mention this. This lesson will not only focus on the questions that are here, but will also be a revision of sorts. So I'll be reminding you of other concepts that you learned in support and movement. So stay tuned. On to our first question. The photograph below shows articulation of bones in a human. Examine it. Now, articulation is a term that is used a lot in this chapter. So it simply means a connection that is formed when two or more bones join together. So a joint of sorts. So before we tackle the questions, let us first observe the photograph. Now, if we are to look at the photograph, we'll note that there are several different types of bones. So we have the vertebrae. These are the bones that make up the vertebral column. Now, a single one is a vertebra, plural vertebrae. Now, there are five different vertebral bones, and these are named according to the region where they're located. So, those that are found in the neck region are called the cervical vertebrae, and these are seven in humans. Those that are found in the chest region are known as the thoracic vertebrae. These are 12. The lumbar vertebrae are located in the lower back. We also have the sacral vertebrae. These are located in the sacral region and they are five in number. Lastly, we have the caudal vertebrae. These are found in the tail region and they are four in humans. Now, again, back to the photograph, we also have two broad triangular shaped bones. These are labeled as B and these are the scapula. Last one, we have the ribs. Now, we can clearly see that the ribs articulate with the vertebral bones at the back in order to form the rib cage. So, I believe this is enough of a recap. Let us go to the questions now. Part A. Identify the type of vertebral bones shown in the above photo. Give a reason for your answer. Now, these bones are articulating with the ribs. So, that means that they are the thoracic vertebrae. Reason. They articulate with the ribs at the back. Part B. Name the parts labeled A, B, and D. So B is the scapula. A and B, these are parts of the vertebral bones, of the vertebrae. Now the vertebrae have different parts. Now if we look at part A, this is a projection of sorts. And this is the neural spine. Now we'll talk more later on on what the function of the neural spine is and its adaptation. Part D, this is the transverse process. Now, moving on to question C, state the name of the tissue found in the part labeled C. Now, if we look at part C, by the way, it's just a space that is found between the two vertebrae. So, this space is usually filled with a certain tissue or a cartilage. Now, the name of this cartilage is the intervertebral discs. Now, the intervertebral discs are, are found between every two vertebrae. Now, they have several functions that they perform. So, let's proceed to question D. Now, question D is asking, list three functions of the tissue mentioned in C above. So, let's talk about the functions of the intervertebral discs. Function number one is that these cartilage discs reduce friction during movement. Now, I want you to imagine a scenario whereby there is nothing, literally nothing, in between your vertebrae. So that means that every time you move, the vertebral bones will be grinding against one another. This will create a lot of friction and it will cause your vertebrae to become worn out over time. Thankfully, that does not happen in most cases because of the presence of the intervertebral discs. Another function is that they act as a shock absorber. Lastly, the third function is that because the cartilage is flexible, it allows a degree of movement or it makes a degree of movement possible. So this simply means that you can move your vertebral column a little bit, stretch it a little bit, and this is because of the cartilage that is between the vertebrae. Part E, explain the adaptation of the part labeled A to its function. So we talked about part A as being the neural spine. Now, if you look at the neural spine, we'll notice that it's quite long. Now, when we talk about it being long, we don't mean that it's, uh, you know, lengthy. We just mean that it offers a little bit of a surface area or it extends. So the neural spine is long. And the reason for this is so as to provide a large surface area 
for the attachment of back muscles, which are necessary for movement. Now, before we proceed with the next question, I would like to say this. The bones that we have in the photograph above make up the pectoral girdle. Now, let me backtrack a little bit. The mammalian skeleton, that is the skeleton of a mammal, is divided into two parts. We have the axial skeleton and the appendicular skeleton. Now, the axial skeleton is made up of the skull, the sternum, the rib cage, and the vertebral column. So the skull is simply the cranium, the surrounding, the one that surrounds the brain. The sternum is the breastbone, the rib cage we've just mentioned, and the vertebral column. So these four main parts make up the axial skeleton. Now, as for the appendicular skeleton, whatever else remains, whatever other bone that has not been mentioned belongs to the appendicular skeleton. So this is where we have the pectoral girdle, as seen above. We have the pelvic girdle. We also have the bones that make up the arms and the legs. Moving on to our second question. The photograph below shows certain bones obtained from a mammal. Examine it and answer the questions that follow. So part A, identify the structure above. Now this structure is the pelvic girdle as we have seen from the photographs before. Give reasons for your answer. Now, there are actually two, no, three reasons why this is the pelvic girdle. Reason number one is that it's made up of two innominate bones. Now, when you talk about innominate bones, the pelvic girdle consists of three bones. These are the ilium, the ischium, and the pubis. But you'll find that these three bones are fused together to form a structure called the innominate bone. Now, we have two innominate bones one on either side. So this is a characteristic of the pelvic girdle. Another reason why this is the pelvic girdle is because of the presence of the obturator foramen. Now the obturator foramen is the part that is labeled as Q. So there we have it. Now you can see it's simply an opening. Actually there are two openings that are, that are there. So we have two obturator foramens. Now the purpose of this is it provides a passage for blood vessels, nerves, and muscles. So they can pass through this opening. Another reason why this is the pelvic girdle is because of the presence of the acetabulum. Now, acetabulum is simply a depression. Now, when talking about bones, if you find that you have one particular bone having a depression, then that means that you're going to have the head of another bone fitting into that depression creating a ball and socket joint. Now, in the case of the acetabulum, as you can see from the photograph, you are having the head of the femur, which is the thigh bone, fitting in the acetabulum to create a joint that allows for the movement of the legs. At C, name the region of the body from which the above bones were obtained. This is the hip region. At D, Name the type of joint labeled P and the structures that articulate to form this joint. So this joint is one that we've just discussed. So this is the ball and socket joint. Now this particular joint is formed by two structures. Number one, the acetabulum and two, the head of the femur. Part E, name the structure labeled Q and state its function. So Q as mentioned before is the obturator foramen. The function of this is to provide passage for nerves, muscles, and blood vessels. Last one, part F. Identify the structure labeled R and state the role it plays during birth in female mammals. Now, R is a cartilage by the name of pubis symphysis. Now, the function of this cartilage is that in females during birth, it widens because it's flexible. So by widening, it provides passage or it allows passage for the baby. Look at that. Amazing, right? So this brings us to the end of our lesson today. Be sure to check out the next video as I'll be discussing the vertebral bones. See you there.